Supposed Bible Contradiction Which Zechariah was murdered in the temple? In Luke 11, Jesus is criticizing the Jewish teachers for persecuting the prophets, and says, So that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. However, if we read the parallel passage in Matthew 23, it says from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah. The problem is that Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, was not the priest Zechariah that was murdered in the temple, but a prophet who lived in the post-exilic period. Second Chronicles 24 says, So it's the same name, but one, uh, but two different person, right? Is that it was Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, who was the priest murdered in the temple. So was Matthew confused and named the wrong Zechariah? Some attempt to address this by stating that Jesus was not referring to when Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, died, but a different and later event, when the prophet Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, was also murdered in the temple. We do not have any record of what happened to the prophet Zechariah after he finished his writings. So it's possible he died in a similar way, like how Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, was murdered. The later prophet was concerned with constructing the second temple in Jerusalem, and it is possible a lost source that Matthew knew about spoke of his death, where he was also murdered in the second temple after it was completed. So, the way he re say here is that because Matthew is relying on a whatever source that he can have his hands on, right? Uh, I think I asked earlier, in, maybe in the comment section, right? What is the role of the Holy Spirit? Because in, initially when Christians say that the, the, the Bible, although being written by men, but they are guided by Holy Spirit. So I thought, is it similar to like a Jibril relaying the, the, the message? But from, but I think some, someone in the comments says, no, it's not like that. They are still writing as them from various sources that they can get on. But the Holy Spirit is there just to ensure that it doesn't deviate. I, I think something, something like that, right? Um, so meaning that it's not as an active as active role as I imagined earlier because it's not like the whole narrative is being being given by the Holy Spirit it's more of oh, oh, okay okay do not exceed I don't know it seems that way right meaning because they, they all uh, still rely on various sources available to human to write for example here so this if there's some missing source or lost source that that happened so the Holy Spirit is just to ensure that it doesn't, I don't know, if, I don't know, maybe if the source cannot be trusted, the Holy Spirit intervene or something? Is that, is that the case? This is one possible solution, since we lack text stating Zechariah the son of Barakiah died in a different fashion. But there is another possibility, when we account for the cultural context of Jesus' day. In Jewish texts, two people from the Hebrew Bible were often conflated. Roger Beckwith says, one must draw attention to the well-established fact that in rabbinical Haggadah, different characters from scripture who are linked by a similarity of name or of other characteristics are often said to be the same person, and this in face of the plainest evidence of the contrary. He quotes Talmudic scholar Swihir Shavis, who says, The rabbis adopted as one of their methods that of calling different personages by one and the same name if they found them akin in any feature of their characters or activities, or if they found a similarity between any of their actions, even where there was only some resemblance in the names of different persons. They blended the two in one. The reason. So this is a. Uh, this is new to me. People actually merge two different people as being different to one. Wouldn't that create confusion? Perhaps what is argued here is that in the old time that is normal, I guess for doing this seems to have been to enhance the praise of righteous men from the Hebrew Bible and to attribute any other virtue to him which is found in any other outstanding personality. Beckwith cites examples of this happening. In the Mishnah, the Levite Pethahiah was conflated with Mordecai. Melchizedek was conflated with Shem, Shealtiel with Ezra. Even in the title for Psalm 34, Achish, the Philistine king whom David sojourned under, is conflated with Abimelech from the book of Genesis. Interestingly enough, in the Targum on Lamentations, Zechariah son of Barakiah and Zechariah son of Jehoiada are also conflated. It records that Zechariah the son of Edo was the high priest and faithful prophet, and it speaks of how he was killed in the temple, which is similar to what we read in Matthew's Gospel. Zechariah the prophet was a descendant of Edo, but not a high priest like Zechariah son of Jehoiada. 
So since the two Zechariahs were conflated in the Targum, it's likely Matthew is doing something similar, which his Jewish audience would have recognized. Luke, who isn't writing to a Jewish audience, doesn't include a conflation, because his Gentile audience would not have been aware of this practice. Craig Keener notes Matthew likely does this type of conflation in other places as well. In 27... So who, which, which, okay, which of the four gospel is written for the Jews and which of the four is written for Gentiles? Hmm, that's, because I haven't had that discussion before, I think. So I didn't realize that the, the, the target group of the four gospel is probably different. In the 10, Matthew does another conflation of Zechariah, but this time with the prophet Jeremiah. Similar to how Mark conflates Isaiah and Malachi in chapter 1 verse 2. Conflating prophets and combining their sayings was a common Jewish practice. So Matthew is likely utilizing the same Jewish technique in Matthew 23:35. Thus as Dale Allison and W.D. Davies say, Given however that Jewish tradition, which often merged two distinct persons, like Phineas and Elijah, conflated the prophet Zechariah with the son of Jehoiada, and given that the death of the latter became the popular subject of legends, we may assume the same for our text, at least as it stands in Matthew. There are a few other reasons as to why Matthew is doing this. The first is to reference all the martyrs in the Bible. Roger Beckwith notes, the Jewish way to arrange the books of the Hebrew Bible had chronicles at the end. So Jesus is essentially saying, all the martyred prophets from one end of the Hebrew Bible to the other will be avenged on this generation. Second, Robert Dundry notes Matthew is likely conflating the two Zechariahs to connect Jesus with the verses from the book of Zechariah that Jesus reenacted or fulfilled. In this way, Matthew could allude to the events that happened during Jesus' final days that correlate to a passage in Zechariah 11, and tie to how Zechariah's son of Jehoiada was also martyred like Jesus. Matthew quoting Zechariah 11, 12 to 13, in relation to innocent blood, the price of blood, and the field of blood, in 27, 3 to 10, suggests that the description of Zechariah as the son of Barakiah rests on Zechariah 1, 1. Of course, Zechariah the pre-exilic martyr and Zechariah the post-exilic minor prophet differ in historical identity, but Matthew conflates them for the literary theological purpose, correlating the betrayal of Jesus' innocent blood which fulfilled the prediction of Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, with the shedding of the righteous blood of Old Testament martyrs, which culminated in the murder of Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada. This fits with how Matthew employed several allusions to the Old Testament throughout his gospel. In combining the two Zechariahs, he could allude to how Jesus would be betrayed and also killed by the Jewish leadership. Thus, when we include the cultural context, we can see Matthew did not make an error. Instead, Matthew conflated the two Old Testament figures to drive home a message. This was a common Jewish technique from the... Right. If that is the message, is that directly understood or it takes this thousand of years for people to realize oh, perhaps this is the reason? The culture. This would only be a contradiction if his gospel was written in our culture, but it was written in a culture that allowed for such conflations to happen without it being erroneous. Thus, this supposed contradiction can be resolved. All right, interesting. Now, of course, for I would expect Christian that is exposed to this kind of discussion wouldn't be the same type of Christian that attack the Quran based on lousy arguments, right? Because they would first say, okay, what is the historical context? How, how is Arabic? One is if they're dependent on English, that's that's that's. <laughs> that's laughable right especially if it comes from christian that goes in in depth in this kind of discussion right? meaning that if you are aware of discussion of okay uh, during the time when the text is being written for the bible right how do they write what is the cultural context etc 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 et normally they would have the same decency uh, to allow for other texts to be seen in the original context as well right hence you would not totally depend on on the translation so yeah so that's one thing but of course if those christian that attacks the quran etc is not even well versed with this discussion in the in terms of the bible that's understandable because they just assume maybe they would have the same assumption with the bible anyway yeah right so that's it that's all i can say um, I think towards the number 20 plus etc um, the type of contradiction that is being discussed is further and further away from what I normally can comprehend straight away uh, maybe I'm not exposed to it prior or maybe the topic is very technical perhaps 
not the fundamental issues etc anyway so thank you for watching see you next time